In chapter 12, we're going to talk about juries in the courtroom and the role that forensic science plays in that. So not all criminal prosecutions require a jury trial. And basically any trial that is considered petty for purposes um, doesn't necessarily require a trial by jury. So what exactly does that mean? In Baldwin v. New York in 1970, the Supreme Court said any case where imprisonment for more than six months is authorized is not considered penny, petty. So essentially, if your possible punishment is incarceration of, six of less than six months or any lesser punishment, you don't have a constitutional right to a jury trial. Now, waiving that right to a jury trial does require an agreement of the judge, prosecutor, and the defendant. And at the state level, we consider a jury basically a protection for the defendant. As such, the defendant's going to have the last word. Now, in terms of us, the required size of a jury, for federal, tr federal criminal cases, jury has to have 12 members. But for state trials, it can have as few as six. Five jurors is considered too few, though. So six is considered large enough to promote group deliberation, to be free from outside attempts at intimidation, and to provide a fair possibility for obtaining a representative cross-section of the community. Now, how effective a jury is depends on the size of the jury. So as the size of the jury decreases, its effectiveness decreases. So larger groups debate more vigorously and collectively recall more evidence and make more consistent and predictable decisions. It also increases the odds that someone who disagrees will have at least one ally. And it means we're more likely to have members of minority groups. They're more likely to spend more time deliberating and reach fewer erroneous decisions. Now, the burden of proof in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt. And in the majority of civil cases, it's a preponderance of the evidence. So preponderance of the evidence basically means 51% of the evidence or more than 50% of the evidence points towards um the defendant being culpable. Now, some civil cases like fraud require a slightly higher standard of clear and convincing evidence. Now, common law did require a unanimous jury verdict for criminal trials, but in 1972, in Apodaca v. Oregon, the Supreme Court held that you could be convicted by a less than unanimous jury. And in this case, it was a jury of 10 to two. But in juries as small as six, the verdict must be unanimous. Now, states vary on this. So some states like Virginia require all jury verdicts to be unanimous. So let's see who's listening. For extra credit, sent by email by Monday, please let me know if Massachusetts requires all jury verdicts to be unanimous. The rules for extra credit require the answer to be sent via email, and the answer needs to also require, also needs to include the email needs to include the answer and a link to a reliable source, a reliable, credible source. No Wikipedia, no ask.com, etc. So there's also a requirement that your jury be impartial. So that means it needs to be chosen from a representative cross section of the community and that the jurors chosen are not biased. Basically, that means they're willing to decide the case on the basis of the evidence presented. Now, many jurors are unaware of their biases. So when they're asked about them, they might not even disclose them. So what impacts do these biases potentially play? Well, stereotypes and dogmatic behavior, the impact of those things increases when people are pressured for time, pressured by other jurors, are exhausted, or need to incorporate complex information and make sound decisions. Now, groups don't rise to perform at the level of their smartest or most excellent member. They perform at the level of their average member. So the placement of even one biased juror on a jury panel can have significant implications. So jury selection um, works like this. First is a jury pool, and that's called a veneer. And that's selected from eligible jurors in the community. They're selected from a master jury list, which is sometimes referred to as a jury wheel. Now, the Federal Jury Selection Act of 1968 
guarantees that jury pools be made up of a representative cross-section of the community. So at the federal level, this is done by taking voter registration lists, driver's license lists, city and phone directories, and other statistical methods to ensure unbiased selection. So for your next potential extra credit question, how does Massachusetts get their jury list? Where does their jury wheel come from? In order to be eligible for federal jury selection, you must be a U.S. citizen who's 18 and has resided in that district for at least a year. They may be able to read, write, and speak English with sufficient mastery, be physically and mentally capable of service, not currently subject to felony charges, and have no convictions for a felony unless their civil rights have been legally restored. Now, automatically excluded from federal jury's duty are armed forces on active duty, fire and police departments, and public officers. Also, you cannot be required to serve more often than once every two years. So for each juror, a biographical report is prepared that's provided to both attorneys. It includes your name, residence, date of birth, gender, race, occupation, employer education, marital status, your spouse's occupation, and the number of children you have. Next, what's going what's to happen is the jury selection process, which is referred to as voir dire. The goal here is to eliminate any jurors with overt or potential bias. An exclusion is based on whether the juror's views would prevent or substantially impair the performance of his duties as a juror in accordance with his instructions and oath. Now, the jury is selected using challenges, challenges for cause and peremptory challenges. Challenges for cause are exactly what they sound like. This person is unable to be an unbiased juror. So you could be removed because you're ineligible to serve, you have a mental or physical disability that would interfere with your ability to serve, you've recently served on a jury, have prior felony convictions, you have a relationship or are related to one of the parties in the case or their attorneys, and most importantly, that you may be partial or biased. Prejudicial factors are important, but they can be really difficult to ascertain because jurors might not be forthcoming about them. There's also really subtle biases that can affect a verdict. So jurors can be questioned about their demographics, hobbies, interests, books they read, TV they watch, their attitudes towards the legal system and organizations to which they belong. They might also be questioned about things like the presumption of innocence, burden of proof and attitudes towards the death penalty. Now, one way we might be able to get some better information about which jurors to pick is through the use of a juror selection consultant. Now, peremptory challenges don't have to be based on any identifiable reason. And at the federal level, for felony cases, the prosecution gets six peremptory challenges and the defense gets 10. So in Massachusetts, in a, a criminal case, how many peremptory challenges does each side get? That's your third extra credit question. Now, if there's a great deal of pretrial publicity, the judge may choose to give each side more peremptory challenges. So at the OJ trial, for example, each side had 20. Now, what about pretrial publicity and the impact that can have on a case? In Irwin v. Dowd, they argued that pretrial publicity prevented Dowd, sorry, prevented Irwin from receiving a fair trial. Eight of the 10 jurors said that they had already decided Irwin was guilty before trial. But the judge then said to them, can you render an impartial verdict? They said yes, and the judge accepted that. Now, in this case, this obviously raises a presumption of juror bias. And the Supreme Court held that when pretrial publicity is substantial, a trial court should not necessarily accept a juror's assertion of impartiality. Now, in Shepard v. Maxwell, five years later, officials allowed that trial to degenerate into a media circus. And Shepard spent 10 years before using a totality of the circumstances approach to successfully argue that excessive publicity deprived him of a fair trial. And at his second trial, he was acquitted. The trial judge had attempted to address all this publicity with gag orders on the press, preventing them from reporting pretrial information. However, this is considered prior restraint. And in 1976, in another case, the Supreme Court held that a gag order was unconstitutional. The right of access to criminal trials is guaranteed by our First and Fourteenth Amendments. And closure of a trial can only be allowed if there's some overriding interest. Now, in a 1991 case, the Supreme Court held that due process 
does not mandate that prospective jurors be asked in voir dire about what specific information they have seen or heard in the media. In the media. A Sixth Amendment impartial jury requirement is adequately satisfied when jurors do not admit during voir dire that they've been prejudiced by pretrial publicity. Now, there's several ways we can overcome this. We can do this in the way we question our jurors. Uh, we can use extensive juror questionnaires. And we can also sequester a jury. Now, what about challenges to jurors based on their race or gender? Now, in Strider v. West Virginia in 1880, the, the Supreme Court held that the state denies a black defendant equal protection of the laws when it puts him on trial before a jury from which members of his race have been purposefully excluded. And that's exactly the kind of injustice that the 14th Amendment is supposed to be eradicating. A person's race is unrelated to their fitness as a juror, and by denying them participation in jury service because of their race, we're discriminating against them. Now, up until 1986, an attorney could still basically use their peremptory challenges without offering any reason. But in Batson v. Kentucky, the prosecutor used their peremptory challenges to strike all four black jurors. And the court said, you can't use them this way. <clears throat> now, that's there twice. Sorry, you don't need that fact twice. Now, addressing the use of peremptory challenges based on gender took longer, and interestingly enough, it was when all the male jurors were struck. Now, women have been excluded from juries based on the doc doc doctrine of prompter defectum sexus, the defect of sex. Many believed it was necessary to protect women from the ugliness and depravity of trials. Now, in J.E.B. versus Alabama in 94, jurors could no longer be excluded on the basis of gender. And in this case, they struck all the male jurors. And the Supreme Court held that to excuse men or women based on gender assumes that men or women hold particular views about gender. And these stereotypes reflect and reinforce these patterns of historical discrimination that are contrary to the Equal Protection Clause. Now, in 2004, um, another attorney used four out of five of their peremptory challenges to strike black jurors. And they argued, oh, no, 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 two of them we struck because they were very demonstrative about their religion. One basically stated he worked as a missionary and one was assumed to be Muslim because of his black garb and skull cap. Now, what about jurors' attributes and how that may impact verdicts? Well, different attorneys have said different things at different times. So in 1936, Clarence Dyro said, wealthy jurors are conviction prone except in white collar cases. In 1982, attorney Belly said that married people make better jurors for defendants because they are more forgiving. In 1986, Wishman said guilt or innocence may have less of an effect on the verdict than whether or not the jurors find the accused to be, quote, their kind of guy. And in 1990, Falero and Penrod said ethnicity, race, gender, wealth, social status, occupation, age, religion, marital status, hobbies, interests, reading and TV, organizations, demeanor and appearance are always important factors, but we have to look at them on a case by case basis. So what do we know from research about physical and demographic attributes of jurors? Well, as far as jurors' age goes, the studies here are kind of mixed. They find all different results. But prosecutors are more likely to peremptorily challenge younger jurors, whereas the defense is more likely to challenge somewhat older jurors. Now, in terms of gender, again, we've got some different opinions here from different attorneys. Clarence Darrow said criminal defendants should avoid female jurors whereas Belly found them to be desirable jurors unless the defendant was an attractive female. F. Lee Bailey, who is pretty famous, he's an attorney from, um, from Harvard, and he was on OJ's dream team, said women are somewhat distrustful of other women. Biskin said that women should be avoided when seeking large damage awards. And Schulers and Hastings said, in cases involving women accused of killing their battering male partners, female jurors are less conviction prone. Now, in terms of occupation, we've got some mixed results here. But when education is used along with occupation level to identify a juror's socioeconomic status, higher status was related to a greater degree of being conviction prone. But there's not enough controlled studies in order for us to figure out whether or not occupation is a significant predictor. Now, physical attractiveness plays a role in socialization and in education. 
Physically attractive people enjoy greater mental health and psychological well-being and tend to have greater success in the job market. But this can also influence verdicts and sentences. So in personal injury suits, more money is awarded to attractive plaintiffs. Now, if a defendant's been charged with killing a pedestrian during a DUI, they're often given more lenient sentences when they're attractive. But this can be a double-edged sword if the jury believes the defendant is trying to take advantage of their good looks. Now, in terms of ethnicity and race, the public and the media often feel that unpopular jury verdicts reflect racial composition, but much of their thought process on this is anecdotal. And these assumptions are based on emotionality, our ability to empathize with the pain and suffering of others, and prospective jurors' desire or ability or tendency to relate to those with similar characteristics, background, or experiences. So is a racially diverse jury better able to make a decision than a racially homogenous one? Well, yes, to an extent. Mixed race juries show increased performance in terms of generating more creative and feasible ideas, but they're also at increased risks of interpersonal contact, conflict and low morale. And there's also issues we want to think about, about historical conflicts between different groups of people. But basically, race and ethnicity are still factors that are used by attorneys in jury selection. Now, what about personality traits? Authoritarianism is a desire for order, well-defined rules, and authoritarian leadership. People who score high on authoritarianism tend to conform to conventional norms and exhibit a desire to punish those who deviate from those norms. Now, this can also be linked to prejudicial attitudes towards certain groups. And the presence of this authoritarian personality does seem to be modestly related to the likelihood to vote for a conviction. So folks who are authoritarian or have some authoritarian personality traits may see criminals as people who've rejected the rules of society and are therefore deserving of punishment. Now, conviction propensity is higher for those with legal authoritarianism, and that is the belief that the defendant did commit the crime with which he is charged and that the arrest was justified. And this can be measured with a questionnaire called the juror bias scale. Now, in terms of locus of control, this is the idea that our belief um, or our, this is not the idea. These are our beliefs about the source of outcomes in life. So someone with an internal locus of control believes that as individuals, we're responsible for our outcomes through our skills and our efforts. An external locus of control basically attributes what happens to you to things beyond your control, like luck and fate. And this can also be measured, and it's measured with the internal, external locus of control scale. Now, those who are classified as internals tend to recommend more severe punishment in DUI cases, to view the defendant as more responsible, and to be more resistant to conformity pressures. So pressures from your fellow jurors to agree with a particular decision. Now, just world beliefs refers to the idea that we get what we deserve and that good things happen to good people. And there is quite a bit of evidence for this. So in a study in England, 33% of respondents agreed that women who were victims of rape are usually responsible for the attack. Now, the reason people tend to believe this way is because it allows us to believe that if we don't behave the same way as that person, we can avoid their fate. And we also typically measure this with a self-report scale. And this is highly correlated with these other personality traits we've just discussed. Now, attitudes toward the death penalty are particularly important, especially in death penalty cases. And there's a standard that's been set. You basically need to be what's called death eligible. So anyone who says they would not vote for the death penalty no matter what is not eligible to serve on a jury in a death penalty case. And uh, that's been decided in both 1968 and 1985. Now, this doesn't necessarily impact the jury in a straightforward fashion, but may influence the weight that a juror gives to aggravating and mitigating factors. Now, people who have positive attitudes toward the death penalty also tend to have positive attitudes toward the police and prosecution. Now, the people most likely to favor the death penalty are white, male, married, upper income, and have authoritarian and conservative personalities. But the relationship between these attitudes and their behavior on a jury is weak to moderate. Now, we'll come back to an idea that I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, lecture. 
This is a concept of scientific jury selection. If you've seen the TV show Bull or you know Dr. Phil, which is what that show is based on, Dr. Phil was a um, ran a very successful jury uh, trial consultation business. And that's actually how he met Oprah. He was a trial consultant for a case that she was being sued in. Scientific jury selection takes behavioral and social scientific principles and applies them to selecting jurors. And we began to see this being used to, again in high profile cases in the 70s. And you should really make sure that you've read the book for those examples. Now, during the last three decades, this has continued to grow. And these firms use academic, behavioral, and social psychological principles to accomplish their goals. And they also rely on market research and advertising strategies. And they could do everything from court in-court assessments, change of venue surveys, mock trials, shadow juries, witness preparation, attorney communication assessments, evidence preparation, focus groups, and even pretrial investigation of jurors. This is a $400 million industry with over 400 firms and 700 practitioners. And that wraps up this chapter.